focusing up there on Brother Billy right now. Are y'all with me? So while you can see things that are just fleeting and passing, some of you drive like this. I mean, well, I'm probably with you. You know, we're sort of driving down the road, and we see all kind of things, but we're not really focusing on all of those things. Now, the problem is with this. If in life you never focus, you find yourself just ambling and wandering around. I'll give you a good example. I read a story of a fellow by the name of Nick. And when Nick was a little boy, he went on a bird hunt with his daddy. And his daddy was a part of a hunting club, and they, hunt, you know, they would hunt quail and dove and whatever. And so, but he was just a little old guy, and they took him out, and he said, Man, it scared me to death the first time that covey of quail got up, and all of a sudden scared me even more when he heard boom, 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 and shotguns going off. And uh, he said, You know, a couple birds fell, and... Um, he said, but I was too young to shoot. And he said, but then there come a day, my dad had me out at the hunting club and all the, uh, his, you know, his friends were there. And it's kind of like almost a rite of passage. And, and we live in the same kind of area because we rednecks around here and everybody hunts and all that stuff and drives these bubba trucks and all that, right? And so he said, it come this time, my dad said, son, it's time for you to learn how to shoot shotgun. And so he coached him through that thing and uh, you know, he loaded one up for him. He talked to him about safety and pointing it in the right direction. And he had put a tin can up just at 30 yards or something, just to, or maybe 30 feet, just out in front of him. And he said, no, son, you need to put that thing in your shoulder and hold it good and tight, you know, and then point that little bead at that can and squeeze that trigger. And he said, man, I worked up the courage, and I put that thing in my shoulder, and boom! He said, I like to maim me on one arm. You know, you remember watching your kid shoot the shotgun the first time? I remember it. In fact, I always tried to get double alt buck or triple or something, you know, just to really load them up the first time. And, but anyway, he said he shot, and I mean, it just obliterated the can. And uh, so he said, you know, when he was about 12 or 13 years old, uh, a year or so after that, he said he went to the Christmas tree on Christmas morning. Christmas was his birthday. And he said there was an unusually long package under the Christmas tree, and it had his name on it. He said, so I took that out, and I began to unwrap it, and it was something beautiful. It was my own gun, but it was not a shotgun. It was a 22 long rifle, a 22. And he said, my dad took me out, and he began to explain. He said, now, son, this thing isn't like the shotgun. It's not going to kick you hard, but... You've got to be more focused. You've got to be more precise because the way a shotgun is built, and I don't know, how many of you know the difference in a shotgun and a rifle? Let me see you. Some of you do, and I'll try to explain for the rest of you. A shotgun case or a shell is about yay long, and um, a 12 gauge is so big around, around three quarters of an inch or something like that. And, you know, there's a lot of gunpowder packed in there, and then there's a lot of beads, depending on what shot it is, if it's number nine targets or number eight for birds or whatever. And the lower the number gets, the bigger the pellets get. When you get on down to double alt buck, you know, three-inch magnum, those, they look like the end of a number two pencil eraser or something. I mean, it's 15 of those pellets. And, but the thing about it is, is when the shotgun fires, the barrel is, like I said, about three-quarters of an inch. It fires, and all of a sudden this pile of gunpowder explodes and it hurls this wad of metal this this lead whether it's double alt buck or whether it's hundreds of little bitty beads like tiny tiny bb's like birdshot and it just goes Whoa! i mean and it shoots it out there and you know for 50 60 yards or maybe even more depending on the ch uh, the uh, the choke that's in the gun I mean, it just, it's a scatter thing. I mean, it starts out kind of tight, and it gets wider. And the further it goes, the wider it gets apart, and the weaker it gets. Are you with me? And so it's not going to be near as effective, um, you know, as a rifle. Matter of fact, in contrast to the rifle, you take this little twenty two that, that Nick got on his uh, birthday and Christmas, that 22, if I were holding a 22 bullet, you probably couldn't hardly even see it from the back of the church because it, it's half of my pinky or less. It's about as big as a pencil, a number two pencil. It's about the, the size of that cartridge, and the tip is just a little, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's not big at all, 
there's just a little bit of gunpowder in that little casing. But here's the difference. When, when you pull the trigger, and, and the barrel is a lot skinnier too. Why? Because when you shoot a rifle, it's only one projectile. It's only the single bullet that is leaving. And all, that little bit of gunpowder is exploding and expanding, and it's pushing that projectile out the barrel as opposed to a shotgun that you got a lot of powder and a lot of beads and it's just boom and we hope we get something right some of you are living life like that I mean you're living life with no real focus no real aim it's like I get up in the morning and load up a few shells and boom 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 it just says um, I, I just hope I hit something today well, that's not a real strategy. Are you with me? It's okay if you're bird hunting, but it's not so good if you're really trying to do something great. So, so when we take a rifle, uh, that 22, now think about this. It ain't loud at all. Uh, you ain't supposed to, but you could probably shoot it in the city and get by with it. The cops ain't in here. I don't see James. I see his wife. <laughs> anyway, you ain't supposed to shoot it in the city. I, I'm not sanctioning that, so just for the record. But, I mean, it, it's, it's really quiet compared to... Now, you let off a 12-gauge in your backyard, the cops are coming. Huh? They're coming. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they're going to be one of them shots fired deals, so don't do that. But, but that 12-gauge is loud. Boom! And everything goes scattering. And, and, and it, it's good. It has an intended purpose. But here's the deal. That rifle, that 22 rifle, is is almost, I mean, it's just a little pop. It's not loud at all. Um, it's deadly out to a mile. Are you with me? The energy will still kill you from a 22 at a mile away. And, but the thing about it is it's got a scope on it, and it's designed to be focused in so that you can literally, if it's where it ought to be, you could shoot a fly off of a fence at 50 yards. No joke. So what I'm simply saying is this, is that we need to live a rifle lifestyle as opposed to a shotgun lifestyle. Now, I hope that you've set some goals. We started this year talking about goals, and we talked about what we ought to do. We talked about our mindset and, uh, you know, our imagination. Last week we talked about relationships and all that stuff. But, but let me say this. If you're living just kind of a shotgun way, you're just hoping that I hit something today. And every now and then you will. But that is totally different than being able to settle in and look down the barrel or look down through the scope. And, and lay that crosshair on a target and say, this is what I'm going to hit today. I, I've done a lot of hunting there with Brother Keith, and uh, he asked me here a while back. I had an opportunity to, to, to uh, come and hunt hogs, and he had his big old boar hog out there. And I'll, I'll never forget, he put me on him. He was a good guy, so he put me on him. And then we had to go a different route because he slipped away in the woods. And I, when I finally was able to shoot him, Brother Keith had lost sight because the hog moved, and so when I fired, he said, did you get him? I said, well, I felt good about the shot. And I said, you know, unless, you always got to give yourself an out, <laughs> unless I have bumped my scope, you know, unless I've dropped my gun, which I highly doubt because I take care of that thing now. <laughs> I talked about cherishing something where you put these expensive cases on your phone. I do that with the, with the rifle too. But anyway... So we got looking, and we finally found it 15 or 20 minutes later. And I hit him exactly where I wanted to hit him, right behind his front left shoulder. And that is because that rifle scope is dead on. And if you can hold it steady, if you can place the shot and don't pull the trigger too hard or let you breathe and get the best of you, you're going to hit that target. And as long as it's not bumped or messed up, you're going to. And likewise, in your life, if you're aiming for something, I don't know what it is. It might be a new position at work. It might be trying to finish that thing you've never finished. It might be whatever it is. I don't know what your goals are, but you fill in the blank. But if you're scattergun, just boom, boom, I hope I get something today, man. I hope something comes through. 
that might, every now and then you have a successful day. But I would say this, you're going to have to targets, you're going to have to acquire the targets, take your time and shoot toward that target. And if you do it like that, my friend, guess what? More often than not, you're going to hit it. Did you know? You don't have to hit exactly on the dime. I could have hit the hog, you know, in, in an area so big and still killed him. You know, I just happened to hit the very hair I was aiming at, but I'm just not. <laughs> just uh, I thought I'd rub that a little bit. But nonetheless, um, you, what I'm saying is this. That's the difference. The shotgun and the rifle is the difference in living a focused life and living a just sort of fly by the seat of my pants. Well, whatever happens today happens today. So listen, being focused is a whole lot more than just being haphazard and hoping that something happens. This successful people, just like this rifle illustration, are not necessarily more powerful people. That 22 is not more powerful than that 12 gauge. I mean, if you look at pound for pound, the powder, it's far, it's far stronger than the 12 gauge. It's a lot louder. It nearly maims you on this end where you could hold a 22 and shoot it like that. But the thing is, is everything is concentrated and focused, not on a hundred pieces of lead but on one the barrel is small because it's only going to allow one to travel through at the time we're not worried about a hundred bullets or a hundred pieces of lead we're worried about one and we've narrowed it down we've honed it down we focused it down that we put our scope on it and we zeroed that down and so all we're concerned about is focusing where this one little tiny piece of lead is going to go and that one little tiny piece of lead fired at the right time in the right place is going to get the job done. Likewise, you don't have, so you say, well, I'm not as strong as there. You ain't got to be. That 22 is not as strong as the 12 gauge. But I'll guarantee you I've had as much success with that 22 as I have with the 12 gauge. So let me, let me just say this. For the most part, highly successful people are just average people that have decided to focus. They're the same as you and I. They just decided today, I'm going to focus. There's a whole lot of talk going on about focus because some of us are so scatterbrained, we can't focus on nothing no longer in about 10 seconds. Y'all with me say amen. I mean, our mind's running a million miles an hour and Man, we started out to do this and then forgot where we left that and, you know, we don't know where we're going. So we got to have some directions. How do you do that? Well, sometimes you got to write it down. You said, I did, Pastor. I forgot where I put my list. <laughs> I'm starting to resemble that remark. <laughs> focus equals direction. Focus also equals power and strength because focus better harnesses the attributes that one has in his hands and pools those limited resources that we have to order more effectively and achieve a goal. Unfortunately, though, most people are not focused in their lives and particularly as it relates to their future. Just sort of getting up today and hoping today is all right. Now, you know, you might say, well, Pastor, I'm retired. I don't have to worry about it. Well, maybe that's, that's all good unless you have any goals left in life or you're just sort of riding it out until he calls you home. If, that, if that's your place, that's, that's, that's cool, man. Live like a shotgun and just, just coast on and, you know, maybe he'll call you in five years or 10 or 20 or whatever. But I don't know. If you still want to accomplish something, you need to focus on something. Amen? Let me just say you want to accomplish a good garden at home. Then you got to focus on that and quit focusing on 10 million other things. Let me say this. This coming Sunday will be a special Sunday for us. Um, uh, and I can't tell you what it's all about, but just be here. <laughs> and, and, and I will talk with you briefly about the difference in having your hand in 10 or 15 things, or not maybe, maybe five or six things, rather than one or two that you do really well. See, because I can do a whole lot of things, but I only do two or three things real well. And that's the way it is with most people. And, and you can try to do a, a bunch of things, but you can't do a bunch of things really well. Uh, so let me ask you this. Have you ever worked nonstop all day? I mean, you just work nonstop all day, 
And when you get to the end of the day, you can't remember one thing that you accomplished. Uh, there are those who mistake busyness for effectiveness. I wish I was talking to a bunch of pastors right now. But uh, listen, there's a difference in being busy and being effective. You know, I, being busy, let's say two men get up this morning, and man, they get home at night, and both of them are just worn to a frazz. I mean, they're worn out. One of them looks back and sees, well, I accomplished this, I got this step done, that step, my to-do list is done, I'm ready for tomorrow, I'm ready for next week, I'm ready for this appointment. The other guy says, man, I don't know if I'm coming or going. I started out today in Callahan and ended up in Statesboro, and I, man, I, I just hadn't done a, a blooming thing all day. There's a difference in being busy. And I'm going to tell you, I experience this as a pastor sometimes. You can do busy things, busy things. You know what happens? We don't do what's important unless we focus and plan to. We do what's urgent. I'll give you an example. I was a life group one night. I was out uh, Spring Hill. And um, one of the girls that was in the life group went out to her car and her tire was flat. I'm not talking about slack. I'm talking about on the rim. <laughs> so there ain't nothing to do but change it. Now, she made the statement, I told my husband about this two or three weeks ago. So it was important two or three weeks ago because the, the wire was already showing. It was important two or three weeks ago. Should have got focused on two or three weeks, but now it's urgent. And now I don't care what you had planned, you ain't going to do nothing till you get a jack and get that tire off and get it changed because we are a slave to the urgent unless we focus and plan. <laughs> well, so listen, the person with focus is an unstoppable force. Luke chapter 11 and verse 34, the Bible says, While thine eye is single, the whole body also is full of light. So what he's saying, that if you've got your mind on a single purpose, if you say, today when I get up, so help me before I'm done, I'm going to fix this car, or whatever it is. I'm going to write this paper. I remember when I was going to seminary, man, that was some long days when you had to write some papers, and uh, Lord, have mercy. But, uh, but I used to just say to myself, all right, self, between the hours of 8 o'clock and 11 o'clock, you're going to be studying and writing. Not going to answer no phones, not going to visit nobody, not going to take no visitors, just going to shut the door, and that's what I'm going to do during that time frame. And guess what? If I stuck to that, I will have accomplished a great deal at 11 o'clock and feel accomplished. However, on the other hand, if an old pal stops by, hey, man, let's go get some coffee. Well, yeah, we need to catch up on times, and we go get coffee. Guess what? I feel horrible at lunchtime because I hadn't wrote one word. I haven't looked up one reference. I haven't made one footnote. I've not written even the cover page. You follow me? So you, you got to have focus. So it's the ability to focus on one primary and overriding objective without being distracted from everything else. And you know what you have to do? you got to plan that. Because if you don't plan that, guess what? If you don't plan your calendar, everybody else does. That's right. Everybody else does. This one stopped by, this phone call happens, uh, this, that, and the other. But if you say, this is what I'm going to do. So if you want to be successful... I don't care if it's in business, if it's in church, or whatever. You've got to be focused. So I'm convinced the reason people fail is not because they're lazy. I, don't, I mean, I know there are some lazy people. Don't look around. Just look at me. I know there's some lazy people, but I don't think it's laziness, and I don't think it's ignorance. I think it is not, it's not lack of talent or ambition, but I think they fail because they have failed to focus on their life. Pastor Dave Martin, who happens to be uh, my coach at this time, he said to me, uh, or he said through, I mean, not just to me, but to everybody who's in network, is that you need to spend 15 or 20 minutes on Sunday night just thinking about and writing down things that must get accomplished this week. 
coming. So that when you get to the office the next day, you don't have to think about and write down all of the things. Because how many of you know, there's things you'll think about on Sunday or in the leisure time. If you don't jot it down, you won't think about it again on next Friday. And you say, oh my Lord, I suppose I have this done tomorrow. So, you can live focused or not. Um, let me say this. If, if, uh, if a lady decides to go shopping and she has to buy, uh, I mean, you give her a certain amount of money. Y'all figure out what that amount is. I don't know. But if you give her this, let's say it's $500 and she's got to buy one dress, one dress. You get a pretty nice one, I think, decent, unless you're going for a wedding dress or something like that. But nonetheless, you go out. Now, now she's going to go, and she's gonna, she knows what class of dress she's looking for because, I mean, if you've you got a $500 budget, you ain't got to go to Ross or Marshall's. Y'all with me? Say amen. Come on, ladies. That's where Kelly buys all her clothes, Ross and Marshall's and Walmart and whatever. But you can go to the upscale, so I, don't even, I can't even name all of them. But uh, anyway, Nordstrom and Macy's and whatever they are. I go in there and just look at prices. <laughs> anyway, she goes in with one single focus. Man, I got to buy one dress. That's what my, my brother told me or my, my husband told me. I got one dress, so I got to take all of this and go find one. Now, if you said it's unlimited, man, Carly would come back with 40. Because she would, she would search the clearance rack until she found one that was $5.75. And then, you know, and she'd probably have shoes to match them because, uh, you know, with the same $500. But anyway, so what I'm saying is, if we said go get one, you narrow that focus down and say, well, here's where I need to go to get this one. If we say just go get them, man, well, we got to stop by TJ Maxx, Coles, Marshalls, Ross. Y'all with me? Say amen. Brothers, I know y'all been down there. I've had to go. Anyway, so you can do anything in life that you want to do, but you can't do everything in life that you want to do. I said you can do anything, but you can't do everything. You see, um, James said this in chapter 1, verse 6. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. He's like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. See, if you divide your heart, you're going to divide your effectiveness. Have you ever been in a situation where you could not make a decision? Uh, yeah, I have. I, come on, ladies. Kelly walk out of that dressing room. I'm holding five dresses. Which one looks the best? I don't know, man. You're talking about somebody that don't even pick out his own clothes, and you're going to ask me how... <laughs> She makes that mistake sometimes. I say, you got to understand, I'm the one that put on brown shoes with something that don't go with brown, whatever that is. I don't know. So anyway, if you divide, if you divide your heart, you divide your effectiveness. But you've seen it before. You, uh, you know, should I do this? Should I not? Here's the deal. You've got to pray about it, seek godly wisdom, and then take an action. There is the price to pay for inaction. Let me put it like this. If you're going down 40 and the light turns yellow and you're 100 feet in, you know, in front and there it is, it's yellow. And, oh, my Lord, and there's a cop right over by Cracker Barrel. What am I going to do? Do I stomp it or do I slam on the brakes and power slide? I don't know. You got to, yeah, somebody said what's right. Just stomp it, man. If he comes after you, he comes after you. If he writes a ticket, he writes a ticket. But at some point, you've got to make a decision and say, this is what I'm doing and go for it. You can't stomp it and then say, whoa, I should have stopped. I should have stopped. That's right. You've got to make a decision and then live with the consequences. Don't, don't ever be worried about I mean, once you've looked at it and you've, you've made your very best decision you can, you've got to live with it. Some of you hunters, you know what I'm talking about. Should I take this shot? I don't know, man. I, I ain't killed no deer yet. I want to take this shot, but I ain't sure about it. Should I? Well, you're going to have to live with the decision once you, once you pull the trigger. You've got to live with the decision. Either you missed him or you hit him or whatever, but you've got to live with it. So did you know they tell us that running through our head is 2,400 thoughts a day? 2,400 thoughts a day. 
Some of them good, some of them bad. Some of them temptations, some of them, uh, you know, instigations. Some of them, you know, good thoughts to make us do great things and inspire us to do lofty things. Others are things that, you know, somebody said something to you and you just, man, I ought to deck them right now. Huh? I ought to put something bad on Facebook about them. I ought to go by and throw paintballs at their house or something. I don't know. But 2,400 thoughts a day. Some of them are unavoidable. Some of them are almost uncontrollable. But you, you don't, listen, you can't help birds flying over your head. But you don't have to let them build a nest in your hair. So if you're struggling, say, oh, my Lord, I shouldn't be thinking these horrible thoughts. I shouldn't act like, I shouldn't feel like, then stop. How do I stop? Tell yourself, I'm not thinking these thoughts. Get you a book. Start reading a book. Get, t- turn the television to something else. Turn on some praise music. But begin to train yourself. I'm not going to allow these thoughts. You know why? Because thoughts become actions. As a man thinketh in his heart, so he is. So if you want to change how you act, you've got to change how you think. See, passions are the strongest in the heart, and they become thoughts, and thoughts that are most prevalent in the mind, they become forces that dominate our lives. You see, if we're not careful, we try to do so many things. Is there anybody here that can juggle? Man, that'd be pretty cool if you could juggle, right? I was watching this cat on uh, YouTube the other day, and man, he's juggling, and you know, I thought it was pretty cool if I could just be coordinated enough to just juggle three, you know? Throw this one, throw this one, and while this one's in the air, throw that one. You know what I'm saying? Just get this thing going. And I, I, you think I could do it, but I can't. Well, I could. I mean, I don't want to say I can't. I can do anything if I put my mind to it and say I'm going to do it and I'm going to accomplish it. I could learn to juggle by next week if I put my mind to it. But this cat didn't just juggle three. He added another one. And then he added another one. And then he added another one. And then he added another one. I'm like, and I'm not talking about just a ball. I'm talking about bowling pins, flipping and I'm like, holy Jesus. But here's the thing. The more balls that you try to juggle, the more likely you are to drop all of them. The more you try to juggle. So what I'm saying is you can't do five or six or seven things super good. So it's important to find out that thing that you are so passionate about that's my job as a pastor to help people find where they fit into the kingdom of god and most oftentimes whatever you do in the real world or on the outside world you can do for god in the kingdom of god <clears throat> to a great extent not always so what i'm saying is don't divide yourselves you see because if you take a concentrate and you dilute it over and over and over again, pretty soon you don't even have the taste anymore. Y'all with me? Say amen. If you take your strength and, and you put some over here, and then some over here, and some over here, and some over here, you're so spread out that you're just not effective no more. And let me give you an example of my own life. My first church I went to, I was a pastor. We were the church cleaners. We were the grass cutters. We were the maintenance people. We were the, she was the nursery lady. She was the kids' church lady. The only reason I wasn't the kids' church man is because I had to preach in the sanctuary. Are y'all with me? Say amen. And, and uh, so we were the cleaners. We, you know, we, we, we did it all. We were the painters when the church needed painting. We were the roofers when it needed roofing. And for a long time, we thought, my God, we have to do everything around here. And even when we ran 50 or 60, 70 people, everybody else thought, because of my lack of leadership at the time, they thought the same thing. Well, that's the pastor's job, man. He lives right next door. We pay his rent. My God. He ought to paint this place, keep it up, shingle this thing, and clean all the toilets and keep them running in tip-top shape and all that stuff. And uh, I come to realize that I, I cannot do everything. I finally learned that there's no way in the world that I'm going to be able to cut all the grass and paint all the boards and and, and do all the Sunday school and teach all the children and uh, do this and do that. You just spread too thin. As a matter of fact, I had Tom Rayner. He's a great pastor's coach. Last year I was reading some of his works. He said, Pastor, the larger the church gets, the less and less you ought to be doing. And I thought, man, you must be out of your mind. 
I said, you can't be serious. And as I got to reading, he said, no, the bottom line is you focus on the three or four things that you know without a doubt that God has called you to do. For example, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, teaching uh, the gospel, equipping leaders, and visioneering for the church. Everything else, you farm it out to somebody else, and you help them uh, to work in the kingdom of God, and you employ others. Don't try to do everything, because if you want to fail and you want to die young, try to do it all. And there's a lot of people that will let you, and you'll kill yourself. That's why, did you know, for really and, tr really and truly, that's why so many churches run about 70. That's about all one man can do. Maybe 100 if he's pretty talented. But you can't do it all. So I think back at Joshua. Joshua learned something from his mentor. Uh, uh, Moses taught him about delegating to men that would lead a thousand or men that would lead a uh, hundred, men that would lead 50, and men that would lead 10. And uh, so you get an infrastructure going so that, uh, and, and now, thank God, Tuesday mornings we have a staff meeting around here where we meet. As a matter of fact, some of you in the senior adult, uh, the life group here that meets, I had 19 people this past Sunday. Give them a hand, would you? I mean, this past Tuesday. Incredible. Uh, 19, that's a, that's a lot, you know, wonderful group. And so, but we're meeting right here in the foyer, right, in, in where the couches and all that stuff. All the staff is meeting right there, and we're thinking about things. And then our, the big staff meeting is tonight in the green room. And, of course, the things that we talked about, we share to all the other leaders, and it gets sent down. And so now, guess what? Sunday is ready to go. Now, um, the big celebration of the 4th of July and America's birthday and independence and all that stuff, we're ready to roll. Uh, we know right now what's going down Sunday. Um, anyway. I could never, 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 never do all that on my own. So, uh, the thoughts that we think, guess what? You know what the Bible says? Life and death is in the power of our tongue. So we can think good thoughts and that brings life, or we can think bad thoughts and uh, that brings death. Are you with me? Say amen. So here's a couple things. I'm going to just say these four things real quick. So how do we get focused? How, Pastor, how to get folks? Number one, control your thoughts. Control your thoughts. Don't let just any and everything run through your mind. Control your thoughts. You can do it. Secondly, to be focused, trade in your busyness for effectiveness. Look over your life, look over your week, and say, okay, what was I doing? Was it just busy work? You see, as a pastor, I could, if I'm not careful, I could answer this phone call, I could run, put out this fire, I could plug this leak, put out that fire, cut this, do that, do this, and not really be effective. I'd be busy all day, but not really effective. Or I could say, well, for instance, there's, there's a couple things that I hedge. One of them is my, my time for study, prayer, Another is coaching. Uh, Monday morning, another is Fellowship One, where I follow up on all the altar results and follow up with the people that made a decision for Jesus Christ and try to, to, to... So I carve out time and I say, in this time slot right here, I'm going to write new guests. I'm going to talk about people that gave their heart to the Lord. I'm going to talk to them. I'll write them a letter. Or I'm going to be praying and seeking the Lord about next Sunday. Or I'm going to be involved in coaching and I'm going to be learning to advance uh, my own skill set in what God has called me to do. So, so control your thoughts, trade your busyness for being focused. Thirdly, give up fear. Get rid of fear. Uh, we are by nature um, creatures of fear. It happens because we get scared. We're, we're scared to try something new. We're scared to go somewhere. We, I mean, that's just part of us. But you've got to get rid of that fear. God's not given us that spirit of fear. Uh, so, and then you've got to focus. The, the last thing is this. You've got to focus on your strengths. Did you know human beings are the only of God's creation 
that does not focus on our strengths. Think about this. What does a tiger do? A tiger is a carnivore. They hunt and they kill antelope and they kill deer. And that's what they do. You never saw a tiger sitting down with a fishing pole. That would be a weakness. He, he's not trying to go fishing. He's not trying to learn how to do this or that. No, he's doing his God-given natural ability to stalk and run and hunt. Think about a squirrel. Man, there's some bad boys. You talking about agile? Son, they can, woo, they something serious. And God gave them the, the kind of feet they just run right straight up a light pole. Hello? Dancing, twisting, turning. And, you know, you never see them trying to swim or nothing like that because fish do all that. I mean, they do their thing there. These squirrels run these trees and these light lines and gather nuts and all of that. And, but human beings, we try to sometime, if we're weak in a certain area, we want to fix all of our weakness. We want to try to make ourselves good at something that we're not really gifted and talented in. They say Tiger Woods was hitting golf balls when he was like three years old. I mean, he's got a natural gift, natural talent. I don't see him swimming. You know why? He, he just, he's doing his thing there. Jack Nicholas and different ones had different. So what I'm saying is this, play to your strengths. Don't deny, I mean, if you're super strong with people skills, why do you want to sit behind a computer desk somewhere and hide all of that? Get with people. Get out there where they're at. If you know you're an introvert and you would rather be an IT person, I mean, you need to be buried in a screen somewhere because you got the personality of a mule. <laughs> then get in that screen. Do something behind the scenes. See, we got a place for everybody, man. You can be a door greeter if you can smile. Huh? And have good breath and all those things. You, yeah. You, you can, you fit into that. Find your strength and work in your strength. Don't try, you, you see, most people, or not most, but a lot of people will take their life and work their entire life and they're never going to be good at what they're weak in. But if you find that natural strength, that you have, that natural talent. Because the Bible says in Romans chapter 12 that God has given all of us some abilities. So don't tell me you ain't got no abilities. You do. God has given us, you know, our retina is the only retina in the world just like yours. Your fingerprint is the only one. Your DNA is the only one. You have got some gifts and some talents that God has given you that is unique for you. And so work in those strengths. Uh, I mean, uh, for instance, God has given Adam a tremendous voice and gifting to play that piano. I don't got enough years left to learn to do it as the way he does it. Are y'all hearing me? Now, I can go over there and hunt and peck a few things and maybe sing and make some cats cry or something, but I, that's not my strength. So anyway, um, so you got to focus on your strengths. Better stand with me and I'll try to say this and... I heard a story about NASCAR drivers. The new NASCAR drivers are scared to death of one thing. They're scared to death of hitting the wall. And I'm not a huge NASCAR fan. But they say new drivers are scared of hitting the wall. And so they go through extensive training to teach them not to focus on the wall because the gravitational pull is toward the wall. Because all you're doing is left-handed turns. The only thing is you're doing 200 miles an hour. You with me? Say amen. Or thereabouts. I mean, you just... You know, pedal to the metal, and you're turning, and, and the wall is just pulling you. Come to me. Come to me. And so they're taught to look to the infield and not focus on the wall. I know this as a skydiver. You will go where you look in a motorcycle class. I remember taking it a number of years ago. They said to us, you will go where you look, so be careful what you focus on. That's where you're headed. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we honor you. I ask you, God, to touch your people today. I pray that you'd help us play to our strengths. I pray, God, that we would um, focus on the next thing that you want us to accomplish. 
Lord, if it's a next level certificate in our life, if it's education, if it's employment, if it's a promotion, if it's a business startup, if it's an entrepreneur, Lord, if it's a relationship, if it's an investment, whatever it is, God, help us to focus and do not be distracted. That we'll focus on that and get it done. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Please don't forget to stop. Amen. Don't forget to stop at the Connection Center and uh, sign up to help us on Sunday if you can possibly do it. God bless you.